Y'all at Exodus, the 32nd chapter, verse 1. And the word of the Lord declares, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off their golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graven tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat. And to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them, and they have made them a molten calf, and have worshiped it, and sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. In the latter part of verse 8, it says, These be thy gods. In other words, your Egyptian gods. Your Egyptian idols, which you brought out of Egypt. He says, these be your your gods. And so we're continuing our series on American idols, modern day idolatry. American idols, modern day idolatry. For he says, these be your gods, your Egyptian gods, your Egyptian idols. What I want to share with you that there are some American idols. And these are idols that come from the world. The world, meaning that our culture, our society, these are things that don't belong to believers, but we brought them up out of the world. You know, we have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have been made new. We have been changed. We have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, delivered from the power of darkness. The Bible declares that we are a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we are are God's sons and daughters. Ephesians 1 says that we have been adopted into the family of God. We have been accepted in the beloved. We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We have been forgiven of our sins. We have been given an inheritance. We have been sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise according to the riches of his grace. And so God has done a whole lot. And we have received a whole lot. And we have exalted him as Lord. But there be some things that we brought up out of the world that don't belong in God's kingdom. 
He said, these be thy gods. And so what I've come to do in this series is to reveal, to make aware, you aware, us aware of these things that have become false gods in our American society and culture and are prevalent even in God's church. The Bible says that the people made a golden calf and worshipped it while Moses was away getting the Ten Commandments. We find in Exodus, the 20th chapter, is where God gave Moses the very first commandment. And he says to him, thou shall have no other gods before me. And before he could get down to share what God had given, they had already violated the first commandment and made this molten calf. The Bible says in verse number five, look at verse four, it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, thy God. He says, I'm a jealous God. And how many know that God is a jealous God? Well, he said it. I'm a jealous God. And he says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so in this day and time that we're in, in America, you know, we're too sophisticated to worship graven images, you know, statues. You know, we're too advanced as a people for that to be the case. You know, maybe in some other cultures, in our culture, that seems to be barbaric because we're too advanced. And we're not going to worship the devil, I told you last week, because we've been too indoctrinated in this thing, and we know that is very wrong. That's too opposite. And we know that's a first-class ticket to hell if we worship the devil. But we can't underestimate what idolatry has morphed into in this day and time. And we got to see things for what they are. i give you the definition real quick on idolatry once again. An idol is anything more important to us than God. Anything that absorbs our heart and imaginations more than God. And anything that we seek to give us what only God can give. This can be anything that takes the place of God as the most important focus and priority in our lives. You can get the tape, you can get the CD or the MP3 or watch it on Facebook. Anything or anyone you treasure more than God. It can be cravings, warnings, and desires. And these think things we seek to bring us ultimate satisfaction. One way we identify idols is through preoccupation. And preoccupation is an idea or subject that someone thinks about most of the time. It's something that just runs in the background. You know, these are desires and cravings and wanting, something that's constantly on our mind. And so we've erected some idols, some false gods, and we've given these things our hearts and our imaginations. I share with you that the first thing that we have to contend with In America, America Idol, American Idol, number one, is the little God of me. The little God of me. Somebody say, the little God of you. No, of me. Because we don't like to admit that we have made ourselves a God. We find in Genesis, the third chapter, Verse number five, God tells uh, Adam and Eve in Genesis, the third chapter, not to eat of the tree 
forgive me. And then verse number five, he says, for God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods. And so this is the enemy's enticement with self-exaltation. And so becoming a God unto ourselves has always been the greatest temptation that Satan lays before us. He suddenly or suddenly emboldens us to take the authority that belongs to God into our own hands. This is the pride of life. And the pride of life is when we overestimate our own importance. We lean to our own wisdom more than the wisdom of God. We have a superiority complex. We just think we're smarter than everyone else. Sometimes we look down on others and exaggerate our egos and have low opinion of others. These are all things that indicate to us that Possibly we've made our own minds and our own thoughts, our own selves, idols. How many know that's an affront to God? And so we need to have a sober estimate of who we are. We can't be intoxicated with our own importance. The Bible says not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to be sober-minded as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So God gives to us a grace, and within that grace is everything that we need to accomplish our callings, to accomplish what God has called us to do. And so we're to estimate in that realm, not higher, not lower, because when we start to estimate higher, we start to enter into the realm of idolatry, self-serve, self-worship, overestimating our own importance, and it's an affront to God. And God says, you become your own God. You won't listen to me no more because you listen to your own thoughts. You seek your own opinions and you have the answers to everything. And God says, that's an affront to me. It's the little God of me. Tell your neighbor, we got to be careful. This is what Philippians, the second chapter, verse 5 through 11 says in the New Living's translation. It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor And gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. And so we see this mind that was in Jesus Christ. And the King James has said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So in other words, it's saying to have a humble mind. That he had the right to claim or to cling to this honor, but he made for himself no reputation. He said, let this mind be in you to have a humble mind. Because how many know that we live in perilous times? Turn to 1st or 2nd Timothy, the third chapter. 2nd Timothy, the third chapter. Let's put it in the New Living's translation, verse number one. We live in perilous times. Look at what the word says. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. King James says perilous times. For people will love only who? People will love who? Do we see that in our culture? Is that not an American idol? Loving ourselves 
And then number two, what? So y'all know where we got to go. But let's just read the rest of it, and then I'll come back to American Idol number two. Y'all already know what it is. It says they will be what? Scoffing at God. Come on, let's read together. Uh huh. What? Verse 3. Oh, man, we need to go back to that. Verse 2. They will consider nothing. Nothing's holy. Nothing's sacred. Anything goes. Subscribe to anything. Make up our own religion. Declare what we want to be right, and it's right because we said so. But we have no divine authority. So none sacred. Oh, do whatever you feel. Whatever floats your boat. If it feels good to you, everybody else is doing it. And so what we call right is no longer right. Some things we call right is wrong, and something we call wrong is not right. Why? Because nothing's sacred. The things of God, people of God, Christians, oh, ain't nothing to them because people have deemed that nothing's sacred because they're lawless. Lawless. Number three. They will be, come on, let's read together. They will be, and they will, no self-control. Can't stop doing anything. Just wow, all over the place. No discipline. Just no self-control. I said I wasn't going to do it, but I'm doing it. I said I wasn't going to do it, but I'm doing it. I said I was going to stop, but I keep going. I keep going. Right? What else? Perilous times. Perilous times. Verse 4. No loyalty. And what? Yep, we're living in these days. What? Peacockish. And... That pleasure principle, just pleasure. Now, I love God, but I love these pleasures way more. Later for you. Later for the things of God. These pleasures, the pleasure principle overrides everything. I just got to be happy. I got to feel good. So we love pleasure more than God says don't do. But we say, well, you know what? But you know what? You know, it's Friday night. Just got paid. But we love you, God, but all of our actions say, God, you are so not a priority. That's why I asked Peter, do you love me more than these, these things? Oh, we love you, God. God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Prove that you love me by doing what I say. Because you say you love me, but if you don't do what I say, then you don't love me like you say you do. Because sometimes we have love for God, but we ain't in love with him. He's not the top priority. We say, God, I love you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength. You better stop lying. You might want to. But just raise your hand if you love God with all your heart, all your soul. No, you got an emotion when you think about God, but the truth is when you go to do what you want to do and God says don't do it and you do whatever you want to do, that's when it's really that's the litmus test. 
Somebody say, oh, me. Oh, me. Jump to your feet and say, oh, me. No. <laughs> oh, I know this is a hard message. Look at, but, but, but look at verse number five, what it says, because this is crucial. They will. But what? The real power that makes them godly, they reject the power that makes them godly. This is what the Bible says. Listen, I'm not the authority, but the Bible is. God said, if you see somebody like this, people behaving like this, you ain't got to hate them. But God says, Because what? You will be corrupted. So we have to ask ourselves, is this me? Lord, is this me? Am I like this? Am I like this in some ways? Do I act religious? Do I reject the power that makes me godly? Do people need to stay away from Do I name the name of the Lord, but I live like this? Am I a stumbling block for other people? Which side are you leaning on? Go, go back to verse number one. First time visitors, I would apologize. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Verse 2, for people will love only themselves and number two, the little God of their money. There is a balance because we were just here receiving the offering, right? Such an atmosphere of excitement. And we need to be empowered. We need to understand that giving is a God principle. And we tap into the law of reciprocity through giving. We need to have money. The Bible says that God will give us all sufficiency in all things. We need money to take care of ourselves and our families. Months, money answer a lot of life's problems and challenges. Money is good in the right way. But we can love it too much. Go to Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse number 24. Are y'all ready for this one? Oh, it's going to get real tight up in here. The little God of money. How do we empower you? without you becoming imbalanced. Well, I hope to help you. This is what the word says. No one can serve two masters, for you will either hate one and love the other. And it's using hyperboles. It's using, it's exaggerating the meaning of things to give you the point. Because, listen, if you, you don't hate money, you hate money, but you're not to love it. Right? It's saying to you that one is going to be your God and the other, one, you're going to serve, 
and the other one is going to have to serve you. Am I talking right? You're either going to serve money or serve God. If you're serving money, you're not serving God. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Again, it is a hyper, hyperbole. It's a purposeful exaggeration of the text to get you to meeting. That you need to get far away from worshiping money and get close to God. Tell your neighbor you can have money. Money just can't have you. Verse 25. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Verse number 26. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Verse 27. Can all your worries Add a single moment to your life. You don't have real power. God's saying, listen here. If I wanted you to be taller, I could have made you taller. But you can't. You can't add one cubit. He calls this in the next verse a small thing. He said, why are you worrying about the other thing? You can't even handle that little small thing. It's a big thing to us. God said, it's small things to me. And he says, that's how great I am. He says, you can't do that. But you want to act like you're bad to control all this other stuff. He says, don't worry about it. Am I talking right? Look at verse 26. Let's, let's read a little bit more. Okay, verse 27. Okay, you can't add a single moment. Okay, verse 28. All right, verse 29. Uh-huh. Verse 30. Keep going. Uh-huh. The same thing. He, he's telling them in a different way, the same thing. Because your, your heavenly father already knows your needs. Verse 33, this is what he tells us. Let's give the Lord a praise for that. <laughs> Hebrews 13, verse number five, New Living's translation. The Bible tells us we got a clear message. What does it say? Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Verse number six. No, you can leave it there. He says, don't love money. He says, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. Can I speak to you practically? If money problems are always on your mind, you got a problem. If your happiness is dependent on destination thinking, you got a problem. Destination thinking. When it comes to money. Like, you're not happy. Your thoughts are always, if, I, if only I had such and such, I'll be happy. It's always future. Whenever I pay off these bills, whenever I get a new house, whenever I get more money, I get another job. Whenever I get something in the future, you don't understand contentment. God is trying to get us out of the place where it's always going to take something else to bring us happiness. If only... 
and we find that it's, it, 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 it's futile. It, it's fleeting. It's always coming, but it never, never happens because we're seeking something to bring us satisfaction that God never intended for. God intended for some things to just add to you, not to be the thing that satisfies you. We think if we're going to have, if we have more money, we will be better off, more satisfied. You might be better off. But we think we're going to be satisfied if we have more money. The truth about the matter, study have shown that money only makes people a little happier. Now, money can do some things. You can go on vacation. You can buy you some nice clothes. You can do all kinds of things. But if you'll find that people, when they get money, if they're sad before they get money, they become a bigger of what they already are. They'll use it to their destruction if they're sad. How many have ever got more money, thought you would feel better, and you realize that wasn't it? Some people say, I want to see, Pastor. People that win the lottery get money. Within two years, they're broke because on the inside, they were not prepared for it. And then they have something that tells them that they are supposed to be broke, so they work to get back broke because it's the condition of the heart, not the external things. Mm. Can I talk to you a little bit more? If you talk about all money all the time, this costs that, that costs this, this costs that. Your family tired of you discussing money, always talking about money. Listen to this. You are tempted to sin when it comes to money. You are tempted to lie and to cheat. You cheat on your taxes. The tithes come every time you get paid and you're tempted with the tithe on a regular basis. You give an eight and you're calling it ten. Ananias is a fire. You could have done whatever you wanted. Nobody, nobody required that you come and bring the whole thing, but you represented it as the whole thing, but it was only a part. The Bible says that they gave up the ghost. Because they wanted to be named amongst the givers, but were not true givers. I just want to be on the tithing record. We already know they pay you $200,000. $100 is not a tithe. For a day, maybe. Can the church say amen? amen? We live way above our means. When we live way above our means, you got a problem. And possibly money or its cousin. I'll talk to you about his cousin. Money has become an idol. 1 Timothy 6, verse number 9. 1 Timothy 6, verse number 9. This is what the scripture says. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation. There are people that long to be rich. You know that's not a good aspiration. Y'all say, What? Longing to be rich is not a good aspiration. Y'all say, well, pastor, why isn't it? Because if you long to be rich, there are a lot of things that are attached to longing to be rich. Because most people who long to be rich, they long to be rich at any cost. Even if that means stepping on other people, even 
if that means stealing or lying or cheating to get there. It'll be better to long to fulfill your calling and your purpose and your destiny. And if you do it well, maybe you'll have some money. If you do it well, more than likely you will have some money. And if your grace is high enough, your ceiling is high, high enough, maybe you will have a lot of money. But you will have gotten there the right way. And because you got there the right way, when you get there, there's no problems. The Bible says people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Is that clear? You will get sucked into that trap. It will bring ruin and destruction in your life. That's why it can't be an idol, especially not for the people of God. This is what it says. It says in verse number 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the and pierce themselves with many. Have left the faith because they've loved money to the point to where. It pierced them through. With many sorrows. You can have money. Money just can't have you. How many remember the OJs? They had a song for the love of. You were trying to remember a song earlier. I was like, no, we can't have more than one song today. <laughs> this is what it said. For the love of money, people will lie. Lord, they will cheat. For the love of money, y'all hear that? Money, 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 money. I know y'all hear it. People don't care who they hurt or beat. For the love of money. A woman will sell her precious body for a small piece of paper. It carries a lot of weight. Call it lean, mean, mean green. Almighty dollar. I know money is the root of all evil. Even the OJs know it. Do funny things to some people. Give me a nickel, brother. Can you spare a dime? Money can drive some people Oh, yeah. Let me share this. Don't give money the power to make you happy. Don't give it that power. You have to learn contentment. Some of us, we've given too much power to money. That's why if only it's all connected to money. But you got to learn to be content in whatever state you find yourself, according to the scripture. You know, the truth is, is God doesn't care so much how much money you have or able to acquire. He wants all your needs met, but he's not so much into, uh, uh, you know, how much money you have or what you acquire. You know, the whole principle in scripture is stewardship. That's what God is after. What is your heart towards money and what are your priorities? If you got a lot or if you got a little, what's your heart towards your money and what's your priorities? Go ahead and get some money. You need to earn some money. 
It's important that we earn some money. It's important that we make some money. But then we are to make sure that we save some money. We also need to make sure that we invest some money. We also need to make sure that we spend some money, which many of us don't have the problem with that. But then we got to make sure also we give some money. And some people, they don't have the right heart and no, no, not the right priorities, so they spend all their money. Some people save all their money. There are some people that give all their money. You remember the woman with two mites? But what are your priorities? Is your priorities straight when it comes to money? Is it balanced? Or is your heart to get as much as you can and hoard it? Right? Is your attraction to money, is it unhealthy to where you feel like your money is your security? You got to ask your question, is God your security or is it your fat bank account? Oh, we feeling good because money is in the account. But when the money gets funny, we get all crazy. We're about to lose our mind, our money, our attitude changes, everything changes. And we think that we're trusting in the Lord. We're not trusting in the Lord. We're trusting in our bank accounts. Paul says, I learned to abase and I learned to abound. I learned to be hungry. I learned to be full. He said, whatever state I find myself, I learned to be content in that state. Contentment. Contentment. We have to learn to be content. Content don't mean complacency, but content meaning having a satisfaction in God. That's what we deal with in our society. This thing called money, we got to be careful that money don't become the death of us. Some people like money, but they like really, number three, what money can buy, which is his cousin, possessions. The reason I like money is because I like what money can buy, what it can buy. Do. I got a ton of scriptures for you, but you don't have time. We'll have to pick it up on Wednesday night. Listen, listen. I'm going to give you a story or two. There was this young man that ran up to Jesus. He said, Master, what can I do to inherit? eternal life he says well how to keep the law thou shall not thou shall not thou shall not he says really I've done all that oh yeah but he tells him there's one more thing it says he had great possessions meaning he wasn't just rich he was rich rich wealthy brother had some stuff come here just another translation says he went and he fell down on his knees. Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Yeah, I've done all of that. Master said, it's one thing. Sell all you have, everything. 
Don't bring it to the church. Just give it to the poor. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, that's what you got to do. says you either serve God or man. He was serving that man. Jesus was saying, you can inherit eternal life. You can be with God if you're willing to dethrone your God. But he was not willing to dethrone his God. can't serve two masters. You're going to love one and hate the other. You've got to ask yourself. Don't allow this message to just get past you and you say, whoa, that one was over. That one is over. I'm so glad that one's over. I got through the message. I survived the message. Sometimes we like to gloss over it and then forget to remember it conveniently so that we don't have to face it. Because if we really hear it, it will change our lives. We'll deal with possessions. And then the fourth one on Wednesday food American idols modern day idolatry Father we thank you and we bless you